Good morning and welcome to A Life Change. This is Eileen Hicks, and I'm so very thankful that you have joined me today. It is February 11th, 2024, and I'm super excited uh, for today and to get into the beginning of Lent. Um, Since I only um, am able to be part of our church community here on Sundays, um, I'm going to kind of um, work around Uh, what we have for uh, the Lenten holiday. So today we're going to actually do Ash Wednesday, which is Wednesday the 14th. So just in a couple of days. So Ash Wednesday is what's coming up. And so we're going to talk about what Ash Wednesday is. I do want to encourage you that if you have the opportunity to go to an Ash Wednesday service to receive ashes, I would encourage you to do that. I think it's important to be uh, part of our community, but part of the community as a whole uh, and going to church. There is a different um, opportunity for participation. And this is one of those levels of participation that's pretty um, pretty fun. Uh, at our church, we're having an Ash Wednesday service at 7. Uh, we will have both communion and ashes. So that is an offering and opportunity for you. If you'd like to come to that, uh, check out the church around you, or if you're connected with the church, um, see what the Ash Wednesday uh, possibilities and opportunities are for you. So uh, we start with that. So as we come together today, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come uh, to you seeking to know you better. We come to you with our struggles and our worries and our cares and know that this journey gets hard. But Lord, you are with us, you renew us, and you give us your spirit to move and change. So Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you and we praise you every moment of every day. Help us to do that in such a way that you would be the focus of our day and our time together. In your son's precious name, amen. Well, as we come into Lent, Lent is uh, Ash Wednesday. So this Ash Wednesday will begin the season of Lent. It's L-E-N-T, not with an I. It's a period of 40 days, not including Sundays. Let me stop for a minute and tell you why. Sunday already belongs to God. And so we don't count that as a day that's specially set aside for God for this uh, opportunity to have Lent. And Lent is that 40 days getting up to Easter, Easter Sunday. These 40 days remind us of the 40 days that Jesus spent tempted in the wilderness. Um, That's one of the scriptures uh, that you might go and look at during the season um, to see what that is, because that's to remind us that Jesus is humanity. Traditionally, Lent has also been a season of repentance, and which is literally turning towards God and away from sin that drags us down. For us, Lent can be a special time in our spiritual lives when we focus on our humanity and devote some time to real self-reflection and practice turning towards Jesus, who waits for us on the cross for Good Friday. This Lent, we will be exploring different practices called spiritual disciplines. These, uh, this is what we can do. These things we can seek to grab a hold of this new life promised to us at Easter. The new life promised to us in Easter through Jesus Christ. We can be changed and transformed. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be changed and transformed. It's an important um, opportunity that we open ourselves up to, that we uh, come to this day, we come to um, each day knowing that God is in charge. So um, let's, uh, I don't know why, but I want to pray again. God, we pray that you will be with us today as we begin this season by looking at ourselves. Help us to see ourselves as you do Give us the courage to change what needs changing so we can grow closer to you and bear your love in the world. Amen. So we're going to go to Psalms 5, 1 through 6. Um, Let's see. Five. um, Oh, sorry. Psalms 51. So not even 1 through 6. Clearly, one page was over the other, and so I just started reading the other way. So we've got Psalms 51 which is in the middle of your Bible, 51, and we're going to go to one, uh, 51, 6 through 12. So uh, um, let's start at 6. Are you ready? Psalm 51, 6. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely your desire, truth in my inner parts, to teach me wisdom in the inner, inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be cleansed. Wash me with whiter, whiter than snow. 
Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a pure heart of God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take me or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So how are we asking to hear God? We're asking to hear God in, in several ways. Okay. Um, in great contrast, we talk about sin and being cleansed to hear the joy prayer for purity and two requests are essentially one uh, David's prayer. Of course, it, it pleased with God to ta- not to take away the spirit that had equipped him and qualified him so that we would be directed in our ministries. So we want to grow in our relationship with God. That's, that's a basis of who we want to be and what we should be. It is important to be honest with both God and with ourselves about where we are, where we are in our own lives. Like the psalmist in verse six, we grapple with the struggles, the shortcoming, the weakness, and our failures. In short, we struggle with sin, each and every one of us. We can accept the forgiveness God offers, which is in seven and nine, and we make changes to grow in faithfulness and happiness, which is six, eight, 10 through 12. This is where spiritual gym discipline of self-examination comes in. So this is a particular spiritual discipline of self-examination. The writer of this psalm shows us some important aspects of self-examination. It's easy to fall into one or two extremes, denying any wrongdoing or avoiding thinking about it at all, or over-criticizing ourselves, punishing ourselves, and giving ourselves low esteem. We need to consider how the psalmist does neither of these two things. He is honest about his sin and brings it to God in confession. Confession is an important part, okay? Now, confession um, can either be um, public or private, and it regards as necessary to obtain forgiveness. It is our opportunity to come to God and acknowledge our shortcomings, acknowledging what we have um, and the, the statement of what we're having that we would be able to then go into repentance to ask for the forgiveness and then receive the forgiveness that God gives to us. I think it's important to know that God gives us that forgiveness the moment we ask for it. But we have to go to a place where we acknowledge that we have fallen short. We acknowledge that God is God and we are not. And in that, we can come to him and ask him to help us. Knowing that God is steadfast in love and abundant in mercy. Um, Let's go to Psalm 51.1, which is just a little earlier than we were in uh, earlier because we were in 51.6. So let's go just a little bit before that in 51.1 to talk about. So in 51.1, here we go. 51.1, oh, mer- oh, have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blow at, blot out my transgressions. Two, wash away my iniquities and cleanse me from sin. Three, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you have proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time of my mother's conceived me. And then we go into six where we were before. So it's important to see that, that he is steadfast in love and abundant in, in the opportunity for us to receive the mercy that he has offered to us. It, he gives us uh, such amazing, amazing opportunity. The psalmist asks for forgiveness. Hyssop is the plant used for sprinkling liquids to purify. The word translated pure, a purge, literally means unsin. Now, for a second, let's just hop back for just one, one hot second. So we're going to stop for a moment and have a conversation about the hyssop uh, and why it's so significant in the Bible. 
Hyssop is a herb that is native to the Mediterranean region and is mentioned several times in the Old Testament and New Testament of the Bible. Um, interestingly, it is brought up most often in relation to the process of being cleansed. God desired his people to be clean, pure, and holy because of our sinful nature, though we continually fall short of the standard, but his mercy and the Lord steps in and provides. The Bible reveals many promises that God made, renewing us in our hearts and minds. Ezekiel said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities, from all your idols, and will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Hyssop is connected with the truth, both literally and symbolically. Hyssop is an evergreen plant originally grown in Southern Europe, but is in the Middle East and Central Asia and is uh, an herb. Um, it grows about one and a half feet in height and um, in the summer it flowers with different colors such as violet, white, and red. Um, so some of the Bible verses that use hyssop in it. Um, so uh, the first time hyssop is spoken about is when God directed his people to use it as a way to set apart them from their oppressors in Egypt. Uh uh, Exodus twelve twenty two. Take a branch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basement, and put the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out the door of your house until morning. And this is one of the. Um, it's actually the last, the tenth plague, um, in the opportunity for Moses to free uh, uh, to help us. God. Okay. Moses asks for our freedom from the Pharaoh, and he is not giving it, and each time he will not give it, um, then uh, God sends a plague. And this is the last one of those plagues. Um, it, this command comes from the Lord, it waited to deliver the people out of Egypt. God already brought down nine plagues on Egypt to show his power, but Pharaoh continued to refuse to let his people go. And the final plague was the worst. God is going to strike down all the firstborn in Egypt from the royal palace to cattle. But he had a plan to protect his people from disaster. The Israelites were directed to sacrifice the perfect lamb, one for each family, to cook and eat the meat, the hyssop was to be put on the with um, painted on the door frame, and they used a hyssop branch specifically. In Leviticus fourteen four, it says a priest will order uh, uh, the two live clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop to be brought for a person to be cleansed. Leviticus four Leviticus fourteen fifty two, he shall purify his house um, with the bird's blood. With fresh water, a live bird, a cedar wood, and hyssop, with the, and the scarlet yarn. So God wanted the Israelite nation to um, live according to His commands and to return their obedience. He would provide all that was needed to bless them. Hyssop, cedar wood, and a scarlet yarn and a live bird were ingredients that they used uh, to sprinkle blood over someone who'd been healed of uh, defiling, like leprosy or something like that. Numbers 19, 2 through 6 talks about the Israelites bringing, um, bringing uh, another uh, uh, cow to be slaughtered so that the, the, um, the priest would take some cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet uh, wool and throw them into the burning uh, fire to to be able to help with that. Later, King David used the uh, image of hyssop as a ritual was washing as a basement for a personal plea to God at a time in his life when he struggled with sin. And David certainly had some serious problems there. So then um, as, as we go through, we, we started in Genesis, we're going through with all the, uh, the ones from... Uh, all the words of hyssop. Um, we go to um, for Psalms 51.7, which is the one that we're using. Um, so uh, it, it talks about being washed clean, whiter than snow. Uh, Kings, uh, in 1 Kings 4.33, he spoke about a plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also spoke of animals and birds and reptiles. So you see how each of these are talking about it. But now I want to go to the one I wanted to talk to you about talk to you about specifically. In the New Testament, hyssop was the instrument of comfort for Jesus as he hung on the cross. He shed his blood to cleanse all of us. 
John 19, 29 and 30 said a jar of wine, a vinegar, wine vinegar was there and it was soaked with a sponge and put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus lips. When he had received a drink, Jesus says it is finished with that. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit in the gospel of John records of the arrest and murder of Jesus. The son of God had been tried beaten and forced to hang on the cross in Golgotha. Amidst this brutality, the final act of kindness was done for him. Jesus was hanging on the cross near death. His mother, Mary Magdalene, and the Apostle John were among those who remained with him. He said, I am thirsty. And someone lifted up vinegar-soaked sponge with him on a stalk of hyssop. John wrote that after after Jesus drank it, he said it was finished and died. So this, the hyssop symbolism of um, in the Old Testament connects to the blood of an animal sacrifice and all that. But as we look, um, as we look with our um, our hearts and our minds open to us, we do see that now we look to the New Testament. In the New Testament, how um, hyssop was used as a divine moment where we uh, connect the Old Testament and the New Testament um, with what Jesus Christ has done for us symbolizes the chance that God offers to us to be washed clean from sin. It also reminds us that he uses everything, including our missteps and our mistakes for our good. Um, Truly by the watering of the Savior's blood made with the hyssop of the cross, we have been restored to white incomparably before that possessed of the snow of innocence. So we have the opportunity to know that we have been changed completely. And it's the hyssop of the Old Testament plant all the way to the New Testament that shows that God used both in both the hyssop branch and the blood of the perfect lamb, Uh, the blood of the perfect lamb to be spread on the doorframe to be conquering death and sin to save them. I mean, to conquer uh, slavery and to set them free. And in the New Testament, the blood of the perfect lamb that conquers death and sin, that we might be saved from the slavery to sin. And so both of those are very important. The psalmist asked for forgiveness and hyssop was the plant used for sprinkling. And um, so it's, it's, the word translates to pure or purge, which actually means to unsin. The writer is asking for his sin to be undone, but it is not just about forgiveness. It's not just about being guilty or avoiding punishment. Self-examination and repentance are starting points for transformation and growth and holiness and happiness. So um, in other words, I talked about it the other day, sanctification, how we are brought from one place to another, how God gives us the opportunity to be closer to him each day. So today I don't do well, but tomorrow I have another chance. And to be quite honest, in the next five minutes, I have another chance. In the next hour, I have another chance. So how, how do I come to a place where each moment of each day, I do what all that I can um, to point to God so that this is for God's glory and God's honor. The psalmist knows that he needs God's help to change and prays for a clean heart, a new and right spirit. So we're asking God to not only take care of us, but we also want a new and right spirit, willingness to keep going and wisdom. These are not things that we can do and give ourselves. It's not a one-time change. The the practice of self-examination can help us see where we need to be and ask God's continued help. So when we see what we need to do, when we understand what God is calling us to, then we can lean forward and say, we need your help to help us. We can't do this on our own. So Lord Jesus, help us to do more. So when we uh, look over the centuries of Lent, so we're talking about how we ask for um, God to, to care for us, to um, uh, self-examination, to understand what we've done wrong and ask God for forgiveness so that we can have his redemptive power to change our lives. Um, so now when we talk about Lent, we talk about self-examination. That's part of what we do during this time. But over the centuries, the season of Lent has been one of spiritual preparation to celebrate Easter. And I invite you now to make a, 
this tradition personal. How I invite you to observe Lent to prepare yourself spiritually for Easter. Consider committing a practice, one of the spiritual disciplines that we will be exploring over the next several weeks. Prayer, uh, reading, contemplating, um, to practice um, meditation on scripture, fasting, confession, repentance, worship, silence, and gratitude. Or perhaps you would like uh, to use this season to practice different disciplines each week. Whatever you choose, may this be a time of self-examination and lead you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. That God would um, work through you and that by Holy Week, you may experience anew the events that center our faith. The things that we have that understand each and every one of how God comes to us. It's encouraging that we have the opportunity to try each one. So we're going to talk about self-exam. We talked about self-examination this week. And so I'm going to ask you to, to wait in that moment. I'm going to ask you to sit in that for a minute. What are the things that you need to talk to God about? What opportunities do you need for God to do to uh, change you? Where are you asking to be washed clean? What are the things that you need to change and ask for a new? What are we trying to pick and how do we adapt ourselves that we would be consistent in our approach to having sanctification or the opportunity to become more like Jesus each day? So let me talk about the ashes for a minute. So um, the ashes are uh, something that uh, we use at the church. Um, the ashes are actually the burnt palm fronds from the, from the Easter before Palm Sunday. So we're going to use the, the, the palm fronds. We're going to burn them into ashes, and then we mix the ashes with um, 100% olive oil. And we put that together, and that becomes what we use to put ashes on the forehead. And so when we have ashes on the forehead, it's a reminder of our limits and our humanity. Um, They may remind us that we live by God's grace alone and that we may call on it, uh, call on him. And as we come to a moment of self-reflection and a genuine turning away from evil and wrongdoing, we want to turn towards you, Jesus. We want to turn towards him and have him change us. So the traditional words over the imposition of of ashes, um, sometimes it's uh, from death, uh, from dust you have come and from dust you shall return. Um, There's many different things you can um, say. Um, One of them could be turn towards God who gives you life. And that would be more about what we're talking about now. I'm not sure how your Ash Wednesday will be, uh, how it will be reflected, uh, what your pastor, priest, uh, uh, what they will do as they uh, talk about uh, the 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 sermon going up to uh, the imposition of ashes, which would actually tell us what um, they're calling us to. And so if I was doing it right now, I would say, turn towards God who gives you life in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I want you to know that many people um, say different things. and Or you could say, God, draw me nearer to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the cross that we put upon your head, that we impose on your head. And we put it there so that we, it is a reminder. It is a reminder of what God does for us. The God who desires truth in our innermost parts of who we are. We have to admit, we have to admit uh, that we often hide our truth from you, God, and even from ourselves. We fear the wrong we may have done or the good we have failed to do. And so we hide it. Today, we ask for you to help us to see ourselves clearly, to help us to face the facts of our lives in the messiness and in the beauty. Forgive us of our sins, sins against you, sins against ourselves, and ultimately, so sins against others, sorry, sins against um, ourselves, and ultimately, Lord, sins against you. We ask not only for forgiveness, but we boldly ask you to create a new and clean heart in us that will sustain a willing spirit within us. 
We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to know I, 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 love, I love how that one's ended and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if we leave a time for silent confession, I, I know that dead air on the radio is one of the worst things ever, so we're not going to have a long time of silence now. But I want you to, after we're off the, the radio, after we have time together and we pray at the end, I want you to take a time to say to yourself, God, where am I and what do I need to do to become closer to you today and tomorrow and the next day? So during these 40 days of Lent, how do I do something different? Now, I do want to say that it's interesting because many times people give something up for Lent. So although I, I'm going to take us away from the conversation we've had so far and move us to another place of giving something up for Lent, well, what does that mean? So there are many people, uh, if you are Catholic, uh, you give up and only have fish on Friday um, and other holy days. Um, there are people who uh, give up social media. Um, because that's something that's distracting. There are people who give up a food. Um, I want you to know if you're a teenager or a kid, you can't give up homework because that's part of what your job is and you can't give up your job for Lent. I mean, I guess you could, but then that would be bad. So what do you do? What is something that is near and dear to you that if you took it out of your life, if you gave that up for Lent, if you took that apart, what would God be able to open up in your life? How would he be able to use and grow you? So that's an important thing. How does he bring us to a place where we can see what God wants us to do differently? And so let's say you give up candy. Okay, well, the next time you want candy, are you going to say to yourself, I know that, that Jesus was um, in the wilderness and he was tempted. And so I'm not going to have candy because I know the temptation of that. And so I'm going to set that aside and say, God, during this time, I'm going to remember what you did for me and I'm going to not do something for you. Maybe that's uh, uh, you spend too much time on social media and scrolling through social media takes you away from time that you could be in his word, that you could be doing a Bible study. What is it that you can do that would be different and more helpful? So that's an important thing to say. Where are we that we would learn and grow and do more because of who Christ is in our lives? And so giving something up, uh, I read a book a few years ago and we did it, giving something good up for Lent uh, because it was candy and chocolates and, and um, things that were totally good. Um, in, in moderation, lots of things are good, but that doesn't mean that if we take that out of our lives for a short period of time, or maybe a long because it's healthier for us, um, do, is there a way that we can replace Jesus in the place that we have something else? Because the reality is we all have many things that we have made a God out of, um, including people and social media and uh, video games and binge watching and all kinds of things that we put in the place of God that we decided are more important than God is. And I know that we don't think that when we're doing it. I know that we're not saying to ourselves, I'm setting God aside so that I can do this. That's not what we're doing. But we do come to a place where we say, what are we doing that God could, um, could spend time with us? And so I think that's important is how can we stop doing something so that we can spend more time with God. So as we enter Lent, maybe you'll give something up. I, I ask you to spend a little time today in, in self-examination and reflection about what God is doing in your life and what God's doing around you and what he is calling you to do that you might be more like him uh, to all those and love your neighbor because he loved you first. I think there's no, uh, there's no way to look at it, the fact that uh, Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday are the same day. So it's, uh, it helps us to remember how much God loved us and how his love for us is something that we can always, always uh, know and um, trust in, that his love for us is true. So uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we ask you to, to give us the opportunity to self-reflect, to see where we are and where you would like us to be. Lord, help us to be uh, washed clean and started anew. Give us a new heart in the name of uh, Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So I encourage you to find a place to go for Ash Wednesday um, that you might uh, uh, experience the um, imposition of ashes. Uh, we're having communion too. Some places are. So um, I know this goes over nine counties. So where you are, uh, find a church near you that's having an Ash Wednesday service and be a part of that. Um, I thank you very much for listening. I work at Sydney Methodist Church, Sydney First Methodist Church, right downtown, uh, 230 East Poplar. If you need something, you can just come around back, and that's where the office is. If you need a Bible or a prayer request, the number there is uh, 937-492-9136. Give us a call, and I would be blessed to, to pray for you, talk to you, or do anything I can. My name is Eileen Hicks, and I am a life changed.